Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Macquarie Technology Summit. My name is Sung Chan. I am a Senior Managing Director uh, at Macquarie's Gaming Group. I help lead the gaming technology efforts. First of all, I'd like to thank each, and, each of our panelists for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here with four companies innovating and uniquely positioned in the online gaming system. With us today are first Lee Fenton, who's the CEO of Gamesys, a leading online iGaming company in Europe that recently announced a strategic combination with Bally's in the US. Number two, we have Benji Levy, president and COO of The Score, a leading authentic sports media brand that has gone all in with sports betting. Thirdly, we have Dermot Smurfit, CEO of GAN, a leading B2B online gaming company that was previously listed in London and migrated their listing to the US in early to mid 2020. And lastly, we have Matt Davey, who's the CEO of TechCorp, which completed its back IPO in late 2020, but he has over 20 plus years of experience in online gaming. Maybe starting off with the first question. So UK and Europe is the most developed and most sophisticated online gaming market in the world. Given that, U.S. investors tend to look at the, U the European markets as a guide to how the U.S. will ultimately evolve here. Gamesys has a leading U.K. online uh, gaming business. Based upon your experience, can you share with us how the U.S. market differs from the U European and U.K. markets based upon your perspective and how you could potentially take those learnings and ultimately apply it to growing your presence in North America? Sure. Uh, hi, Sun. Uh, good to be with you today. Thanks for the invite. Um, always great, of course, to start off with a narrow, focused question. <laughs> um, I think we could fill your whole summit talking about the differences between US and Europe. Could be anything from ecosystem development to product development to customers. You know, I mean, the list is endless, right? So maybe. You know, I, I can just answer that thinking about it from our experience. You know, we've been in Europe for 20 years and thinking about our experience of North America for the last seven. We've been in New Jersey since day one. I guess the first uh, difference I'd point to is quite obvious, right? I mean, it's the fact that land-based casinos are much, much more interwoven into the fabric of the leisure industry than they ever have been anywhere in Europe. And, you know, we saw that from the first day of operations in, in New Jersey today, we offer a site for Tropicana Casino, um, obviously it's via a land-based partner, via Caesars. Um, we also operate a pure play online, which is under license from the Virgin brand, which we own and manage. I think the first point is we believe omnichannel will be important in the US. Second difference I'd point out really is how are people going to make the till ring, right? I mean, where do you find long-term sustainable profitability in the market? You mentioned the repeal of PASPA. Of course, that has brought about the huge rush for sports legislation um, with some states, but of course, far from all legislating for eye gaming. I think one key lesson for the US from Europe is that iGaming is absolutely critical to driving the profitability of business. And it is so much more predictable and it allows you to continue to invest, enhancing your product and enhancing service levels. So, and I think <coughs> iGaming and it becoming more prevalent across the US is super key, super key for all of us. And um, lastly, just one shout out on responsible gaming. You know, right now the US is all about growth, 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 and rightly so, you know, there's new states opening all the time. But over time, growing in a socially sustainable manner is going to be really important, right? It won't be long before the first media reports hit about the next pandemic, right? Which is online gambling and how that is taking over US consumers. Uh, you know, operators in Europe have been facing this for a few years now. So having responsible practices baked in 
not just to your operations, but also to technology, I think is going to be a good lesson to learn for those looking to grow sustainably in the U.S. Shifting over to sports, a key theme that's been taking place within uh, the sports betting industry, and it started off in the U.K., especially uh, uh, you know, with Skybet and all the significant success that they've realized, it's really the convergence of media and sports betting. Uh, Benji, you know, maybe if I can shift the next question to you, uh, can you touch upon how you see this convergence playing out in the near term as well as medium term? And how does media play such a critical role in the overall sports ecosystem? Yeah, for sure, Song, and, and thanks for having me today on the panel. Um, listen, it, it really, for, for us, it's no surprise that media, it should be no surprise for anybody that media is playing a core role in the rollout of sports betting uh, in, in North America. For the past 50 years, media has sat at the nexus as, you know, as the driver of fan engagement around sport. And um, and media companies from, you know, from, from, from television and radio and now digital, have amassed audience millions and millions of sports fans who are you know, flocking to their platforms to follow to, to watch the games to engage with the, you know with other fans around the games and so as online gaming platforms are looking to build their audience there's there's it, it's no surprise that they're going to fish where the fish are as we're thinking about you know as a media company when Pasqua fell we had a big decision to make. It was, okay, so, you know, how do we approach the market? Do we just sell advertising or do we become an affiliate? Um, you know, but you know, for us, that felt, you know, le way less than fulfilling to just be taking this, you know, highly engaged audience and turning it over to someone else, especially when, you know, we had this vision and this view that you can actually create an experience that's product-led that um, differentiates you from, uh, you know, other potential operators in the market by actually, you know, bringing the bet as close as possible to where that consumer engagement, uh, you know, is, is, is taking place. And, and we think that's something that uh, can be pretty unique and compelling and differentiating moving forward. Maybe shifting over to the B2B landscape, um, you know, Dermot, if I, if I can start off with you, you know, GAN has done an incredible job of building a market leading presence in terms of servicing the, uh, the B2C companies, uh, in particular within the US market. Uh, where you started was within the UK European uh, markets, but uh, as mentioned uh, during the intro, in 2020, you came into the US and did your US IPO. Can you per perhaps provide some perspective on some of your experiences in terms of providing the B2B services to these companies here. A key theme that's been resonating throughout the market, and this has been touted by some of the larger scale players, is about owning your own tech uh, to be able to provide the optimal services. Um, you know, that is not how the European market's necessarily structured. Uh, and once again, the U.S. is in the early days, how do you see this dynamic evolving over the course of the next several years? Thanks, I appreciate the uh, open format for uh, addressing that question. But let, let me just start with one of the unspoken truths about the United States uh, versus say Europe or even the UK. The truth is, is there's just more money here. You can see that in all of the numbers being presented and published as all of these states begin to switch on and particularly in the four states where not only online sports betting is offered, but also iGaming has been regulated and legislated for. So the, the, the more money aspect of America mm -hmm. isn't just a macroeconomic debate. It's a truth about customer value fragmentation, which we saw play out over the first 10 years of our organization's life in Europe, where uh, every other week there'd be a launch of a new skin by a B2C operator, where they'd go from one website on day one to 50 different websites, all of which had slightly obscure brands in order to acquire the user and then keep hold of them by carouseling them around other secondary or tertiary uh, websites or mobile apps. So that's, that's what we're not seeing here in the US. I'm a firm believer in the very clear bright line of truth that the customers are today, have shown over the last eight years in a maturing market like New Jersey and will continue to show vastly enhanced per unit customer economics, as opposed to the UK or other European markets where uh, in the absence of any 
strong regulation or prohibition against launching multiple brands, you will see just the customer wallet being subdivided again and again. So it's a slowly melting blob of value spread across a, a number of hungry B2C operators. Uh, Matt, maybe if you can perhaps provide a you know, one to two minute perspective on uh, in-housing versus B2B from your perspective. And uh, then maybe we can shift over to SPACs, uh, given uh, where we are uh, in, in, from a timing perspective here. Thanks, Sun. Look, I, I think um, it, it is a complex subject, but I think the industry itself has worked on um, <clears throat> moving through this pendulum swing over the last 20 or 30 years. It reminds me of when um, Len Ainsworth kicked off Aristocrat. Uh, there was an early story of him manufacturing his own screws to go into the boxes of the slot machines. And I think the industry has grappled with where is uh, competitive advantage and where is your profit margin. Uh, and one of the things that's very evident when you get into digital gaming e-commerce is that you're looking at costs that don't scale, fixed costs versus the variable costs. And obviously licensing and technology delivers a variable cost base. So it is something that is scrutinized, um, but I think it's very, very clear that every operator in houses uh, some technology and every operator licenses in other technology and it's right across the board some do it more than others but i don't think there's been um you know, one example that you can point to that says this is the only way to do it um, i think there are many different ways i think the u.s market um, particularly lends itself to licensing and technology simply because of the highly fragmented and complex infrastructure that's set up and I think uh, th there are always going to be the pull uh, for competitive advantage to come across from control of your roadmap um, and speed and deployment. But you have to balance that versus cost and where your resources need to be deployed, which in this space of the market in the US is really around customer acquisition, and customer retention. SPACs, the four letter word that nobody heard of 10 years ago. Now it has become the rage here. It's been increasingly relied upon as a way to access the public markets here. Um, I mean, the question at hand is obviously you you have your own SPAC, uh, which IPO'd late last year. Uh, is SPACs a fad or is this a way of the future? Is it here to stay? Uh, what differentiates a SPACs versus perhaps doing an IPO the regular way here? So I think SPACs solve a certain problem. They're not the right solution for every business looking to go public. Um, but they do solve a couple of key things, and that particularly lends itself, I think, to the gaming industry that we've got here in the US. Uh, step one, um, speed. You, know, you can get public faster, typically via a SPAC, than you can via an IPO. You can halve the time. Two, you can talk about the future, um, and that's because of the unique structure of SPACs where we have already followed our S1, and it's more a merger and acquisition versus an IPO. Why is that important today? It's important because the US market uh, for online gaming is 24 months, 36 months old. And um, you've got a lot of growth in the future and investors really are looking at these assets based on, on their future prospects. And by uh, transacting with a SPAC, you give yourself a platform to really talk through what that future growth looks like. And I think that's important. So speed and, and the future, I think those two things help define that. And then there's a whole range of other, what I would consider important variables. You get to really work with your shareholder base and you get to define the price at which you go public at, you get to control a lot of the variables around the business as opposed to just diving into the, uh, into the uh, public market ocean and, uh, and swimming uh, with whatever you land on. I want to thank each and every one of you uh, for joining this panel. It was a pleasure. And uh, we hope to have a follow-up session in due course where we can delve into these subject matters and look look back to see who was right and who was wrong. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, see you, Benji. See you, Dermot. Take care, guys.